the next speaker who's coming up here, I'm very, very, very excited to introduce. Not too long ago, a friend of mine got in contact with me and he said, uh, what do you know about this Rhonda Patrick person? I said, Rhonda Patrick, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, I haven't heard. He's like, dude, go right now, pull up the Joe Rogan podcast and download Joe Rogan's interview with Rhonda Patrick. He said, she is, I mean, she's like your mental sister. She's talking about all the stuff that you constantly talk about. And I was like, hmm, okay, why haven't I heard of this person? So I started digging in a little bit. I pulled up the podcast and listened to it and immediately sent out a tweet to Rhonda. Got in contact with her. I said, the paleo community really doesn't know about you. This is going to be your coming out party. But this community is going to embrace and love everything you have to say. So, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Dr. Rhonda Patrick has a PhD in biomedical science and has done extensive research on aging, cancer, metabolism, and nutrition. She has published in multiple high-impact scientific journals, including Nature and Science, and is an expert on the science behind nutrition, health, and longevity. This presentation is going to knock your socks off, I guarantee it. Please welcome Rhonda Patrick. Thank you for that fantastic introduction, Keith. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm quite the expert that Keith says. Um, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Um, but and I have been doing some research for, for quite some time now. As Keith mentioned, I have a PhD in biomedical science, and I've done research on aging, um, mitochondrial metabolism, cancer, and now I'm doing research on um, nutrition and micronutrient deficiencies, like vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and how these deficiencies can precipitate diseases of aging, like cancer and neurodegenerative disease. So, um, but in addition to that, I have a platform called Found My Fitness, where I like to break down the science behind nutrition and health and fitness to the general public in a way that you all can understand. And also um, in a way that's accurate because that's really important. There's, I think there's a lot of press, uh, a lot of people trying to um, get you know, this health and nutrition information from scientific studies and, and oftentimes uh, they're not accurate in what they uh, glean from those studies. So uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about how what you eat in your diet, particularly micronutrients, how things like exercise and even something called hyperthermic conditioning can change the expression of your genes. And so what does gene expression mean? So we can actually me measure the expression of thousands of different genes at once through something called gene microwave profiling. And genes that are expressed, they're active. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and those are typically indicated in red. And genes that are not expressed, they're not active. And so they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Even though the gene is there, it's almost as if it wasn't there. And what's really interesting about these changes in gene expression is that they're regulated by what we eat, by how much we eat, by what we don't, don't eat, by uh, how much exercise we get, how stressed we are, how much sleep, what time of day it is. I can go on and on. Um, and I'll get into this epigenetic part in a little bit. But I want to highlight the importance of a particular micronutrient called vitamin D, which is actually a fat-soluble vitamin that it gets converted into a steroid hormone that regulates the expression of over 900 genes in the human body. So that's to give you some perspective about 1 24th of the human genome regulated by this steroid hormone, vitamin D steroid hormone. And vitamin D can turn on and turn off expression of, of genes. So uh, I recently published a paper a couple of months ago uh, in FACIP Journal where I found a mechanism by which vitamin D uh, turns on the expression of this gene that makes an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase. Tryptophan hydroxylase is the rate-limiting enzyme that converts tryptophan into serotonin. And serotonin regulates a wide variety of behaviors, uh, emotional behavior, aggression, anxiety. Um, it regulates cognitive function, learning, and memory. So the fact that vitamin D is important to make this enzyme, and this enzyme makes serotonin in your brain, shows you that vitamin D is regulating some brain functions that also impact your behavior. So not only does vitamin D regulate your brain, but it also regulates the aging process. So telomeres are tiny caps at the end of your chromosome. So every 
cell in your body has 46 chromosomes, and your DNA is wound up inside these chromosomes. And telomeres are these little, like, orange caps at the end of these chromosomes that protect your DNA from oxidative damage, from inflammation, from these things that can damage your DNA and cause um, mutations that are irreversible. Uh, so you can kind of think of telomeres like the M, like the tips of shoelaces, so they protect your shoelaces from fraying. And what's really interesting is that telomere length is actually a biomarker for aging. So the younger you are, the longer your telomeres are. And as you age, uh, your telomeres get shorter. And that's because we lose about 21 structural units off of our, our telomeres every year. So every time the cells in your body, whether they're liver cells or pancreatic cells or immune cells, whatever cell type it is, it's, it's, as it's proliferating and dividing, it starts to lose telomeres every year until they're shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually, there's no telomeres left. So what happens at that point is your cell goes into a crisis and it decides to die or go into a permanent state of arrest. And at this point, your cell isn't functioning anymore. So literally, as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. It's a biomarker for aging. And we know it's involved in the aging process. Some, some diseases that have um, aberrancies or abnormalities in maintaining their telomere length, such as Warner syndrome, um, is an accelerated, uh, they age at an accelerate, accelerated rate. So if you look here, a woman at 15 years looks about normal, and then at 48 years, she looks like she's about 98. So uh, telomere length does play a role in how we age. So this brings me back to vitamin D. Um, a few studies have looked at the role of vitamin D in, in telomere length, and one particular study that I like is one that was done on 2,100 different uh, twin pairs. And these, they measured the vitamin D levels in these twins, and what they found was that those twins with the highest levels of vitamin D, serum levels of vitamin D, had the longest telomere length. And those with the shortest had the shortest telomere length. And what they found was that the difference in that telomere length corresponded to five years of aging. So those twins with shorter telomeres, even though chronologically they were the same age as their sibling, their cells, their, their, the cells in their body looked like they were five years older, which really uh, highlights the, the importance of this difference between your chronological age in years and your biological age. So the way you treat your body, you know, how, what you're eating, and how much you exercise and th things like this impact your biological age. So you can actually have someone who is chronologically older but biologically younger because they're getting the right micronutrients, they're doing the right things, you know, exercising and doing things like paleo where they're lowering, lowering information, not eating a lot of sugar and things like that. So um, the mechanism by which vitamin D regulates telomere length brings me back to the gene expression. So vitamin D increases the expression of genes that are involved in repairing damaged DNA. They're DNA repair enzymes. Um, so it lowers DNA damage, um, which is one thing that can um, make your telomeres get shorter. The other way is that uh, vitamin D uh, increases the expression of anti-inflammatory genes and it decreases the expression of pro-inflammatory genes. So vitamin D is lowering inflammation. Inflammation also can accelerate telomere shortening. So these are the two mechanisms by how vitamin D can change gene expression and that can regulate the way you age. So just to highlight the importance of vitamin D in the aging process, these mice here are the same age. The mouse on the left here is vitamin D deficient, and the mouse on the right is normal levels of vitamin D, and they're about four and a half months old here. Here are the same mice four months later. So the vitamin D deficient mouth, mouse looks pretty gnarly. I'd say that's probably an understatement, um, but it's, there's tons of different multifunction, uh, you know, dysfunction going on where, you know, it, it, there's a variety of different genes, 900 different genes are being dysregulated, and that's affecting the way this mouse is aging. And what's really terrifying is that the most recent uh, survey by NHANES found that 70% of the U.S. population does not meet the requirement for adequate levels of vitamin D, 70%. So to me, that's terrifying, but why is that? So vitamin D... We can make it from the sun. Um, we can convert something called 7-dehydrocholesterol in our skin to vitamin D3, but this depends on UVB light. So you need UVB light to interact in order to convert this, this cholesterol into vitamin D. But things like sunscreen and dark skin color filter out the burning rays of the sun, so they filter out UVB light, but they also prevent the body from making its own vitamin D 
Um, in addition to that, high body fat um, can regulate the bioavailability of vitamin D. So vitamin D is fat soluble, it's stored in fat. The more body fat you have, um, the less bioavailable it is to be released into the bloodstream. Vitamin D3 gets released into the bloodstream, and then if, if you're making it in the skin, um, if you're eating it orally, of course, it, it gets absorbed. Um, but then it gets converted into this pre-hormone in the liver and then goes to the kidney where it gets converted into the active hormone which regulates all these genes. So body fat can also uh, affect the bioavailability of vitamin D. In addition to that, age. So the older you are, the less efficient your, your body is at making its own vitamin D from, from UVB uh, light. Um, in fact, a 70-year-old makes one-fourth less vitamin D in their skin than their former 20-year-old self. So all these things are impacting um, the, the micronutrient, the vitamin D deficiency that's very prevalent um, in the United States and actually um, even globally. Other things that can increase uh, or change the expression of genes that affect telomere length are meditation. So meditation has been shown to uh, increase telomere length by a different mechanism than vitamin D. And that mechanism is it increases the expression of a gene that makes an enzyme called telomerase. And telomerase is an enzyme that can actually rebuild your telomeres. The only problem is that most of the cells in our body, that gene is there, but we don't express it. Like I said, express, gene expression is important for genes to be active to do what they're supposed to do. So meditation can in increase the expression of this gene that makes telomerase. And there's a reason why most of our cells don't um, express telomerase, and that is because um, cancer cells oftentimes will upregulate, they'll increase the expression of this gene to make, help make them immortal. So I think our bodies have a, a very tight regulation on how much of this enzyme we uh, increase the expression of. Um, but it does rebuild our telomeres, and meditation has been shown to increase the activity of it. Exercise has also been shown to increase telomere length. Um, in another study that was done on 2,500 twin pairs, um, those twins that were the most active had the longest telomeres, and those that were the most sedentary had the shortest. And if you compared the most active to the most sedentary, there was a difference in 10 years of telomere length. So 10 years of biological aging difference in the telomeres that, from the people that were the most physically active compared to the ones that were the most sedentary. So it's a pretty significant difference. If you ask me, if you're looking at someone that's the same age uh, you know, as their twin, and you look at their cells, and they look 10 years biologically younger. Um, exercise not only regulates your telomeres, but it also makes you smarter. So this study was published a, a few years ago back in PNAS, and they found that exercise increases the expression of genes that make neurotrophic factors. So neurotrophic factors increase neurogenesis, which is the growth of new brain cells. Um, and not only did these people grow, grow new brain cells, uh, these people exercised four hours a week, by the way. The study was four hours a week. Uh, they also had an increase in the size of their hippocampus, which is the part of your brain involved in learning and memory. So exercise not only makes you have more brain cells, but it makes your brain cells that you have smarter. So some other things that can regulate um, neurogenesis are dark chocolate and tea, uh, red wine and blueberries, and also uh, people, sex, and cannabinoids. Um, which are found in marijuana, have been shown. So, um, I'm just conveying the message here. So how is it that we can change the expression of our genes? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a very simplistic version of the epigenome. So as I mentioned, changes in gene expression, you can increase genes, they're active, or you can decrease the expression of genes, they're not active, even though they're there. And these, thing, these certain factors called uh, epigenetic marks like methylation groups, acetylation groups, they sit on top of your genes, in your DNA, and they'll turn genes on and they'll turn genes off. And these epigenetic marks are regulated by micronutrients, by exercise, by stress, by sleep. And what's really interesting is that these epigenetic marks not only change the expression of your own genes, but they can also be passed on through the germline, so through the uh, eggs and the sperm cells, to your offspring, to your children, and even grandchildren we're finding out now. So to highlight, uh, I, I guess I'll give you an example, uh, starting with mice. And so this mouse here, a little fatty, uh, was fed a very high inflammatory diet. He was uh, given lots of corn oil. So um, he became obese and got type 2 diabetes. Big, big surprise, we know the role of inflammation uh, in, in type 2 diabetes. 
Um, but what was a surprise is that he had an offspring, a female pup, that was given normal diet. So they weren't, this pup wasn't given a high corn oil diet. It wasn't given a high inflammatory oil diet. But the pup ended up getting type 1 diabetes. So it wasn't able to produce insulin. And that's because the high corn oil inflammatory diet in the male, the father, changed the expression, epigenetically changed the expression of genes involved in uh, the insulin production in the, their beta islet cells. And this was passed on through the sperm. And so this pup now, you know, even though it didn't do anything wrong, has type 1 diabetes. Um, so let's look at a good example. So this is a classic study that was done in U uh, Duke University where researchers took um, these mice that have like yellow fur. Um, and this yellow fur, these mice are called agouti mice. And the gene that encodes for the yellow fur is the agouti gene. And um, while their fur is really pretty, uh, the problem is, is that this yellow fur, the gene that encodes for this yellow fur, also predisposes them to obesity, to cancer, and to uh, type 2 diabetes. So having this yellow fur in mice is a bad thing because you're, gonna, uh, become, you're more likely to get obese and get cancer earlier. And what they did was they took female mice and they fed them a diet high in B vitamins. They gave them folic acid and they also gave them B12 three weeks before they got pregnant. And what they found was that these mice had silenced the agouti gene. They had methylated that agouti gene and was passed on to their offspring. So even though the offspring had that agouti gene, it wasn't expressed and they no longer had the yellow fur. And they also no longer had type two, were predisposed to type 2 diabetes and cancer and obesity. So that really highlights the importance of having good micronutrients in your diet because good micronutrients are uh, important for regulating gene expression. And actually, um, folic acid is, is a prime example. So folate actually um, is important for making DNA. It, it, it's important for making something called thiamine, which is one of the nucleotides in your DNA. But it's also an important methyl donor. So it's, folate's an important uh, micronutrient to have in your body because it's a very important to provide these methyl groups that, are, like I mentioned, sit on top of your DNA and will turn genes on or off. Mostly they turn genes off, but they also can turn them on. Um, and just want to mention here that um, the enzyme that people need to get this methyl group from the folate, um, a lot of people have a mutation in this gene, the methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, reductase gene. So um, many people have a polymorphism in that gene, and subsequently, they, even though they're getting enough folic acid or dietary intakes of folic acid, they actually aren't getting enough um, to provide these methyl groups. And what happens is when you get your homocysteine levels measured, they'll be really high. And you may be a little confused if you eat a good diet why your homocysteine levels are high. Well, the reason is because um, you're not, you actually need much higher doses of folic acid um, if you have this polymorphism. So... Um, just to highlight the complexity of um, humans here and individual variation, you can't, you know, what one person requires for you know, micronutrient intake, another person may actually require more or less of. So not only um, can epigenetics uh, reverse or predispose you to diseases like uh, type 1 diabetes um, but, or, type, or type 2 diabetes, but can also, uh, it's important for learning and memory. So things like learning and memory can be passed on epigenetically. So in this study, um, researchers took mice that were genetically engineered to get neurodegenerative disease. And they put these mice in what's called an enriched environment. They put them on this, they gave them these toys to exercise, to stimulate different regions of their brain, the vis visual re region, the somato somatosensory region, the motor region. And um, what they found was that this exercise and stimulating these parts of the brain increased the expression of genes that are involved in long-term potentiation. And long-term potentiation is what making connection between neurons so that you can, these are the connections you make when you're learning something, when you're actively learning new information, which you all are doing right now, long-term potentiation is going on, and that is how you're learning it. So these mice increase the expression of those genes, and therefore they scored better on learning and memory tests, um, which is really cool because they're genetically engineered to get you know, like an Alzheimer's-like neurodegenerative disease, so they're not supposed to score well in learning and memory test. But what was really, really interesting about this study is that these mice had offspring mice, okay? And those offspring were also genetically engineered to get neurodegenerative disease. But they weren't given exercise equipment, they weren't given this enriched environment, they were just put in a cage with some bedding and some food. But they had retained that, gen that increased gene expression of long-term potentiation genes. So they had reaped the benefits of their parents. So they also had increased long-term potentiation, and they also scored better on learning and memory tests, even though they weren't exposed 
exposed to the exercise in the enriched environment. Epigenetics, people. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears here um, and I'm gonna talk about something, a new fitness hack that I just recently introduced into the, the fitness community. Um, I did a guest blog post on Tim Ferriss's four hour work week a couple days ago um, where I'm introducing this concept of using heat stress um, through something like the sauna to cause, uh, to induce physiological adaptations that allow you to better deal with heat stress later on. So for example, um, when you're exercising physical activity, you're increasing your bo core body temperatures increase, that's a heat stress. So um, this, this term I call is hyperthermic conditioning. And what I'm gonna talk to you about is how hyperthermic conditioning your body uh, to heat stress through the sauna can um, cause endurance enhancements, can help you maintain lean muscle mass, and can also uh, have positive benefits on the brain. So um, let's talk about some of these endurance enhancements. So hyperthermic conditioning through using the sauna um, to condition your body to heat stress, to deal with heat, um, actually increases blood flow to your muscles um, later on when you're elevating your core body temperature. And what this does is as this uh, increases nutrient take to your muscles, so you're having more esterified fatty acids, more glucose and oxygen being transported to your muscle cells so that your muscles rely less on local glycogen stores when you're doing some sort of endurance training, and this has been shown in multiple studies. In addition, it also increases blood flow to the heart. So um, this improves cardiovascular mechanisms. So actually, uh, for the, it lowers the heart rate for the same given work strain or the same given workload that you're applying. Um, and so it allows you to maintain exercise for longer. And it also improves the thermoregulatory mechanisms. So uh, being heat acclimated um, or hypothermic conditioning can allow your body to start sweating at a lower core body temperature and also to maintain that sweat for a longer time period so it actually cools your core body temperature and it also activates the sympathetic nervous system uh, cooling your core body temperature. So um, what kind of endurance enhancements can you expect to gain from hyperthermic conditioning? Well, in one study, uh, 30 minutes on a session twice a week for six weeks after their running session, these are male runners, uh, they experienced a 32% increase in their running distance until exhaustion. Um, and that corresponded with a 7% increase in plasma volume and a corresponding 3.5% uh, increase in their red blood cell count, which is thought to be a compensation for the increased plasma volume. Um, this is one study, but if you go and look, check out my article on uh, the four-hour work week blog, you'll see um, multiple other studies that back this up and so that support um, this study. Um, in addition, hyperthermic conditioning can help you uh, maintain your lean muscle mass by three mechanisms. The induction of heat shock proteins, which I'll get to in a minute, and this is where the gene expression comes in, and this is also where I'm going to talk about hormesis, and also through the induction of growth hormone and by improving insulin sensitivity. So let's start off with the heat shock proteins. So heat um, causes heat stress, and this, the, the response in your body to this heat stress is to express, uh, to increase the expression of genes that make something called heat shock proteins. And uh, this is really a prime example of hormesis, so where you apply stress, so heat is a form of stress, exercise is also a form of stress, you're also elevating your core body temperature, so you're stressing your body, but there's a stress response. Your body responds to this amount, this stress that you're applying by increasing the expression of genes that can deal with stress. So it increases the expression of genes like antioxidant genes. Um, in this case, when you apply heat stress, it increases the expression of genes that make heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins are pretty awesome because they repair damaged proteins. So they help these proteins. Proteins in your body are what are doing all the work and they repair proteins that are damaged to make sure that they have their proper structure. You need your proteins to have their proper structure in order to do what they're supposed to do. And they also prevent oxidative stress. So they scavenge free radicals and they also increase glutathione uh, recycling. So these heat shock proteins, HSPs, um, are very, very uh, important and also a really cool uh, hormetic response to heat that um, can help your body uh, deal with stress. And what's, what's interesting is that they also, because they can repair damaged proteins and prevent oxidative stress, they prevent the degradation of proteins because both oxidative proteins, oxidated, oxidized proteins get degraded, and also um, proteins that are not 
uh, that are damaged, that are not in their proper structure, they also get degraded. So what ends up happening is that heat shock proteins can cause a net increase in uh, protein synthesis, which if, you're, if we're looking in a muscle cell is, is kind of important. If you're trying to uh, maintain muscle mass or even gain muscle mass, you obviously need to apply a work force or apply a workload during whatever sort of physical activity that is, and also you'd like to, you need to have a protein synthesis, a net protein synthesis gain, uh, which is also important. So um, when you hyperthermically condition your body to heat stress through the sauna, what ends up happening is that under normal temperatures, so when you're done with the sauna, sauna under normal temperatures, you actually have a higher expression of these genes and these heat shock proteins just under normal temperatures. And then what happens is later on when you increase your core body temperature when you're exercising, you have an even higher level, oops, even higher level of these uh, heat shock proteins. So let's talk about what this means functionally. So in mice, mice that were subjected to 30 minute, um, I guess kind of a sauna session for mouse, they put them in a little chamber, it's called whole body hyperthermia for 30 minutes. And um, they did this every other day for a week. And what they found is that when they made these mice, they immobilized them, they put a little cast on their little hind legs so they couldn't move for a week. And then they took the cast off and let them move around again. So, um, so they were then, this, this reintroduction to exercise usually causes a big burst in oxidative stress. But what they found is that these mice actually had a 30% uh, increase in their regrowth in their soleus muscle, and that corresponded with an increase in HSP70, heat shock protein 70. So that the fact, and this was compared to the mice that were not hypothermically conditioned. So these mice that were hypothermically conditioned, high expression of HSP70, the other ones didn't, and they also regrew their 30% the more of their soleus muscle. Hyperthermic conditioning can also inhibit muscle atrophy uh, through, through a similar mechanism. So in one study that was very similar to one I just talked about, they hyperthermically conditioned these mice, and then they immobilized them for a week, and they found that uh, the ones that were hyperthermically conditioned lost 32% less of their uh, muscle. So, and that's because hyperthermic conditioning increases the expression of HSP70. HSP70 can prevent oxidative stress on those proteins. It can also decrease inflammation because it, decrease, it uh, decreases the expression of um, NF-kappa B or inhibits the activity of NF-kappa B, which is known to play a role in accelerating muscle atrophy. And that's how you're able to maintain your muscle mass. So just an aside here, um, I thought was kind of cool is that HSP32, a specific heat shock protein, um, also known as heme oxygenase 1, can, has been shown to protect against rhabdomyolysis. Uh, rhabdomyolysis, for any of you guys that don't know, can occur during very, very, very extreme muscle overuse. Um, and what happens is that your muscle tissue starts to break down and it releases myoglobin into the bloodstream, which is then toxic to the kidneys and then you can go into kidney failure. So HSP32 um, actually degrades myoglobin. So HSP32 is a heme, uh, it catalyzes a reaction that degrades, degrades heme, which is in myoglobin. So they've shown that HSP32 in mice can protect against rhabdomyolysis because it degrades that myoglobin uh, before it can be toxic to the kidneys. Uh, and this is very different from uh, the role of most HSPs in preventing protein degradation, but I thought it was a really interesting um, point. So how does hyperthermic conditioning um, affect growth hormone? Well. Uh, hyperthermic, so sauna use um, can increase the expression of, uh, sorry, can uh, increase the release of growth hormone um, by quite a bit. Um, and that, so the way that growth hormone can help you maintain muscle mass is um, by, usually medi mediated by IGF-1. And so IGF-1 can affect protein synthesis by increasing mTOR, and it can also decrease protein degradation by activating um, FOXO genes. And so this is how increasing growth hormone can help uh, maintain muscle mass because it's hel it helps maintain that balance, that net protein synthesis. Um, and so actually if you take IGF-1 and express it in the muscle cells of mice, um, they, it causes hypertrophy. So mice that have IGF-1 here, you can see their forelimb and high limb, uh, they have much higher levels of uh, muscle mass compared to just a normal wild type mouse. Um, that's just to highlight the role of IGF-1 in, in, in hypertrophy basically in the muscle. So how does the sauna affect growth hormone? Well, it all depends on the temperature of the sauna, the amount of time you're in the sauna, and the frequency that you do it. So for example, two back-to-back 20-minute -back sauna sessions at 176 degrees Fahrenheit 
uh, has been shown to increase the expression of growth hormone by twofold over baseline. Two one hour sauna sessions, this is totally extreme, separated by a 30 minute cooling period um, for three days in a row, can, express, uh, can increase the expression of growth hormone over baseline by 16 fold. Um, and that's something, it's very extreme. Just, it's just to highlight the, 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 what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that you can hyperthermically condition your body to uh, cause these physiological adaptations um, that help you, you know, upon later heat stress, you're, 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 you're adapting and there's certain cellular responses that are occurring. Um, and so this, there's a few studies if you want to take a look at the article on the, the four-hour work week blog that I uh, just did a, a guest blog post on. So the last way that hyperthermic conditioning can affect muscle mass is by improving insulin sensitivity. So insulin is well known for its role in, in glucose homeostasis, um, and, but it also has a role in protein metabolism. So in skeletal muscle, um, when you're sensitive to insulin, so when insulin is released, you uh, take up glucose into your muscle cells. And this can actually affect protein synthesis by activating AKT, which um, increases protein synthesis by mTOR and also decreases degradation by, uh, by activating FOXO genes, so increase, changing those expression of those genes, and also um, by increasing the uh, uptake of amino acids into your muscle cells, so that affects protein synthesis, and it also inhibits something called the proteasome. The proteasome is this cellular, cellular complex inside your cells that's responsible for degrading a lot of proteins. So this um, inhibits the, that activity from happening. And actually, if you look at type 1 diabetics, the um, ones that cannot make or produce insulin, they have a very severe muscle wasting, wasting and that's because uh, they don't have this inhibition on the proteasome, so their proteasome keeps degrading all these proteins, and so their skeletal muscle um, catabolism is uh, very high. So, um, so how does this relate to the sauna? Well, Hyperthermic conditioning in, in a diabetic um, mouse model, so this obese diabetic mouse model, when you put these mice um, for three, three different sessions a week in a 30, uh, I think it was a 30 minute session, um, and this is for 12 weeks, if you hyperthermically condition them three times a week for 12 weeks, um, they actually showed a 31% decrease in insulin and that corresponded with insulin sensitivity. And what, what they found was that these mice increased the expression of genes called glucose transporters. Specifically, it was GLUT4 transporters in their skeletal muscle. So exposing them to this heat, this hyperthermic conditioning, changed the expression of GLUT4 uh, transporters, increased them. And so what happened is when they, made, when they produced insulin, even though they're insulin resistant, they had an increased expression of glucose transporters, and so they actually took up glucose into their muscle cells, and the cell was like, oh, I got my glucose, I don't need to make, keep making insulin, so it stopped making insulin, and that's why there was a 31% decrease in, in insulin, which is really kind of cool, and I'm hoping to see more research in this area um, on using, you know, something like hyperthermic conditioning or heat stress, um, and how that can help improve insulin sensitivity. And lastly, I'm going to just mention some of the cool effects on the brain. So hyperthermic conditioning has been shown to have very profound neuroendocrine effects um, and other effects on the brain. It's been shown in both men and women to increase uh, not only the release of norepinephrine, but uh, the storage of norepinephrine so that you can later release it. And norepinephrine um, helps with focus and attention. So um, I think that's kind of cool. It also increases prolactin, um, increases in both men and women, but really um, profoundly seems to increase prolactin in women. And prolactin has been shown to be important for myelination. Um, and myelination is uh, very important for a lot of reasons. Um, it also helps the connections between your neurons so that your brain can function faster. And um, lastly, it increases the expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, so BDNF. Um, which is important for neurogenesis, so growing new brain cells. Um, and also, it's important to enhance learning and memory. So um, these are just sort of a brief uh, overview of some of the cool effects that hyperthermic conditioning has on your brain. And uh, there you have it, people. So what you eat, uh, your diet, particular micronutrients in your diet, can change the expression of your genes. How much exercise you do if you're stressed, uh, how stressed you are, and also even things like heat stress, hypothermic conditioning, these can all change the expression of your genes 
And the changing the expression of, the, of these genes can affect both the way you age, so your longevity, but it can also affect your performance in the case of uh, endurance enhancements. So um, I'd like to just quickly give a real quick call to action if you liked what I had to say here. Go sign up for my newsletter, foundmyfitness.com. I have a free report you can choose from uh, when you sign up for my newsletter. I have one on omega-3 and also on coconut oil. Um, also, if you liked what I had to say today, please help me share this with the public. And the number one way you can do that is by going and reviewing my iTunes podcast um, and also on Stitcher. That's, that's probably the, the best way you could help me increase this message to the public because it will increase the likelihood that they will see what I have to say in my podcast. Uh, and lastly, I have a few milestones I'd like to achieve. I, I do uh, research full time, but I also have this Found My Fitness platform where I put out podcasts and articles. And um, I, ha I have this Patreon where you can become a Patreon pledger and pledge a dollar a month. Uh, and when I reach my milestones, I have a couple of milestones, one where I'll, I'll put out two podcasts a month and one where I put out four po podcasts a month. So um, I'd really like to reach those milestones because it'll give me some uh, strong motivation to get, do more podcasts on top of the, the research I'm already doing. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for listening. I hope you learned something. And I'll take questions. Very, very cool. I think your website's getting ready to get blown up, Rhonda. I have a, um, a friend whose husband had the rhabdo... Myelitis. Um, yes, mm -hmm. in, the, in the military. He survived. Um, he's doing well. Would the hypothermic um, conditioning, would that be good for him now? He's still in the military. Um, would yeah. that be beneficial or would so, it be harmful because he's still kind of in the repair? Yeah, stage? I would say that um, anyone that's in a diseased state or in, under something that's injured, if they're in the process of um, you know, something, recovering from something like rhabdomyolysis, because heat is a stress, you know, the hormetic response is good when you're not in a very stressed state because then it increases the expression of these genes that are involved in stress response. But you, when you're in a stressed state and you apply more stress, it's not good. So I would say probably, you know, I, you, know you, might, I, you know, it's something that you might want to talk to your doctor about and make sure, um, but bring it to their attention um, possibly. But I'm not going to recommend uh, anything. It's something that you might want to just bring to his attention um, when he's fully recovered. Um, so, Get ready, Rhonda. They're coming rapid fire. <laughs> I've just read so many conflicting reports about the best way to get uh, bioavailable vitamin D in the past couple of years. So I was wondering what your opinion is on the best way to get your vitamin D levels up. The best way would actually be to get it from the sun um, because it's so complicated. Um, once you make it from, when you make it in your skin, it gets released, it goes to this like capillary bed and it binds to this other protein called vitamin D binding protein. 100% of it binds to that. And that protein is responsible for transporting it to your liver where it gets converted to the pre-hormone. Anyways, I won't go on. But when you take it orally, um, which is still good, uh, only about 60% of that oral vitamin D gets bound to that protein. So, and, you know, and 40% of it gets degraded in liposome, like, you know, with the liposomal fraction. So uh, it's, you know, I don't, I don't with, with that said, it's kind of like the sun's the best way. But, you know, with skin cancer, and for me, skin aging is a problem, so I do take a vitamin D supplement. Um, vitamin D3 is actually easier to convert into the active steroid hormone than vitamin D2 is. Um, so in that sense, I would recommend a vitamin D3. And also, I would recommend um, getting vitamin D levels tested. It's really simple and cheap. And um, I recommend the optimal uh, serum range of your vitamin D levels be between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, and that's based on a few studies, scientific studies, where they looked at um, vitamin D levels and all-cause mortality. And they found that those people with vitamin D levels within that range of 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter were, uh, had the most uh, reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, and something that's really important with vitamin D, it's fat-soluble. You can get toxic amounts of it. Um, the, the Institute of Medicine has stated that it, that doesn't happen unless you're taking more than 10,000 IUs a day. Um, but the, the thing is, is that when you, are, when you have too much vitamin D, uh, what can happen is that you can have too much calcium in your bloodstream and too much calcium in your bloodstream can cause calcification on your arteries and um, bad things, so. Thank you for the presentation. Um, regarding the hyperthermic endurance gains that you get, 
I know hot yoga isn't 176 degrees Fahrenheit, but do you think that you can get some benefits from that kind of training as well? I do. I do think so. Hot yoga is in, it's inducing a heat stress. And so the whole, a lot of these studies were done using like a dry sauna. And that's, you know, the reason I put that up there is because that's the study method. Um, but the concept is, is that heat stress, um, which hap happens to be, it has to be a you know, pretty dramatic heat stress. I'm not sure sitting in the bathtub is going to do that. Um, but I think something like hot yoga, because you're exercising, which is inducing core body temperature or increasing core body temperature. And on top of that, you're doing it in the heat. So you are in, you know, applying a heat stress. Um, it would be really cool to see some studies on that. I'm waving my hands on this, but I would have to say I do think you probably would boost your heat shock protein expression um, from doing something like hot yoga. Rhonda, Dr. Rocky Patel. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, we use gene expression scoring to evaluate patients for obstructive coronary disease in our practice. So we see changes in the expression in these scoring. What, do you, what, what have you seen in the literature in terms of the amount of time you need to do to make nutritional changes, environmental changes, to see changes in gene expression in your experience, or at least what you've seen in the research? Um, so in, in the context of like, you know, coronary artery or even just heart, actually, I, I think the, the study that I remember the most is the prostate. Um, I think this was done at UCSF by Dean Ornish. Um, they took biopsies from prostate, um, people that had low, low level prostate cancer, and they put them on this very rigorous diet and gave them a bunch of supplements and exercise. And uh, after three months, they did another biopsy, and there was like a changes in gene expression in over 500 different genes. But I think it all depends. I mean, in some cases, you know, changes in gene expression, um, like in the case with fol you know, folate, you know, can happen pretty quickly. Um, but it, it depends on you know what gene we're looking at. You know, how there's a lot of different uh, factors that that are into play there. The protein half life of this, you know, because these things all are important. If you even if you change the gene expression, if this protein's already been made and it's hanging around for a really long time. It's going to take some time before you, you see any functional consequences of changing that gene expression. So I think it, it's very variable. Oh, I had one question for here. Basically, oh, sorry. Oh, being in Texas where it's hot year round and a lot of us are CrossFitters, so we work out in the heat regularly, like, are we always kind of exposing ourselves to this heat? Um, stuff like so we're getting the benefits so we don't need to go to a sauna or should we look for saunas like does right that make sense? it totally makes sense um I, I haven't seen any studies directly comparing uh exercising in in heat like in texas heat uh versus sauna but i have seen uh, studies looking at you know heat acclimation by exercising in like you know desert and places that are really hot and yes you do get some of those physiological adaptations from doing that now whether or not you shouldn't look for a sauna i can't really tell you um you know, there's no really direct comparison, but I do I do know that exercising in in Texas heat does. What's the temperature do you see the change? Um, so yeah, so the question is, what temperature do you see the change? Um, and it depends on if we're talking about the ones that were done in humans. Um, so some of this, the study in humans where they're looking at humans that went in the sauna. Um, I think the lowest temperature I saw was like 146 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that doesn't mean that anything less than that won't. For, the, for example, the mice studies, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, that induced heat shock proteins. But you know, they, didn't, they didn't look at anything lower. I didn't see any studies doing like a different dose response in terms of the temperatures. But that's kind of a cool idea. I'd like to see something like that. You know? Another reason to live in Austin. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much. I live in Maine, and all my friends have saunas. I prefer them at 200, though. Um, I have a question, uh, an addition, and then a quick question here. I've reported a lot over the past five years um, on the research related to the deiodinase enzymes that activate to reduce T3. So when people are doing hyperthermic conditioning, um, their active thyroid levels will drop. Reverse mm -hmm. T3 goes up. And it's happening at the deiodinase level in the cells. Um, and that's quite clear. And it doesn't take much more than 20 minutes of high temperature, relatively high, like a swimmer in 80 degree water in 20 minutes is going relatively hypothyroid. Is there a genetic reason for that as, that you've seen in the literature related to epigenetics? Because I've not seen the fundamental reason as to why it happens except evolutionarily preservation of capital. Yeah, no, um, I have, cannot answer that question. I have, but that's a really good question. I will look into the literature uh, to see if there's any sort of anything I can find. Uh, but this is the first time I even heard of this, so very, very interesting. 
Are those improvements in uh, growth hormone sustainable, or is it something that you just initially get maybe the first time? And how often do you need to do the uh, training in order to get maintain the response? Great question. So um, the increases in growth hormone release are transient. They last about two hours. Um, so it's not like you're going to walk around with acromegaly or anything. You're not going to consistently always be making growth hormone. Um, in terms of the frequency, uh, like I mentioned, the, the two 20-minute sauna sessions that were back-to-back, -back, I think that was separated by like a 10-minute cooling period. So, you know, about 40 minutes or so at uh, 176 degrees was enough to in induce it by twofold over baseline. Um, there was another study that was about 30 minutes that was something similar to, to twofold as well. So, and uh, that was just one session. So. Okay. I'll get. Can, So, so the question was, is that daily or is that once a week? And um, so the answer is uh, the, that, that particular study that I mentioned was just a one time. Um, but if you remember, I also showed that people that went in there for two one-hour sessions three times a week induced it 16-fold. Um, and I'm sort of extrapolating here, but that's, uh, the frequency seems to make somewhat of a difference in how much you can boost it over, over your baseline. But with that said, um, there's a certain point where you're, you're, you can't, you know, make enough, you can't keep doing this and make enough growth hormone to keep being, you know, 16-fold over baseline. Um, and that was clear in that study because after three days of doing this two one-hour sessions, you know, back-to-back, -back, uh, day after day, after the third day, it started, the growth hormone increases were not as, as big as 16-fold, so they started to go down. Um, but that's going back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back for that long of a time is very extreme. So... Um, does that answer your question? Okay, I've uh, read some interesting things about cold thermogenesis and how, like, you know, it, doing the extreme on the other end of the, like, heat or the temperature spectrum can have some interesting benefits. And I'm wondering if you were to engage in, um, you know, doing something with temperature, do you have to decide if you want to do cold thermogenesis or hypothermic training, or can you do them both at the same time? And what does that look like? <laughs> well, can't do them both at the well, same uh, time. Simultaneously, but, like, could you engage in, like, maybe one one day and then one the next day? Like, right. Or do you have to focus on one at one period of time and then do the other the other period of time? And what kind of different benefits do they have? Yeah, uh, those are all fantastic questions. Um, I haven't done a ton of research on hypothermia. I do. I am aware of some of the um, metabolic changes and the thermogenesis that can occur that helps you speed up metabolism. Um, and I have seen a study where they they there was a sauna session was done, and immediately after the sauna session, it was a cold shower or a cold bath, one or the other. It was cold shock after the hot, um, and that. Uh, had an interesting effect on the brain, so it, in it increased the release of norepinephrine even more than heat alone um, from the locus coroleus part of the re uh, region of the brain. Um, so that's just one specific study that I saw where they actually did one after the other. I know that like some cultures, I think it's Russian cultures maybe, that they like to do the sauna, then the cold chuck immediately after, maybe even in Finland as well. Okay, yeah, so, you know, that's the next thing I'm gonna start researching. I, I spent like tons of time just looking at the hyperthermia, now I gotta look at the hypothermia to see. So I can't, you know, tell you the best protocol, um, but I do think there'd be some benefits to doing them switching. Did you see any research compared to infrared saunas and whether there's similar benefit there? Right, um, so, you know, because most of the research that I was looking at, they were using dry saunas. In some cases, they did a human sauna. Um, I haven't seen any direct comparisons in terms of these benefits on far infrared saunas, infrared saunas versus just dry sauna. Uh, but, you know, it'd be something, it's something that I have my eye, I'm looking into to see if there is any real science out there to show any differences in terms of some of the benefits that I, I talked about. Um, but the idea is that far infrared sauna obviously also increases your, your core body temperature, so you are inducing a, a hyperthermic response. So I heard uh, Chris Masterjohn give a talk on the importance of the fat-soluble vitamins uh, A, D, and K all together. And he showed a lot of uh, convincing argument that isolating one over the other, like D without K or K without D, could um, create some problems in the body. And I was wondering if you found anything along those same lines, like whether having the D without the K or anything like that um, prevents those same problems or whether, you know... Um, 
it's smart to just do D or whether you should do fermented cod liver oil to get all of them or kind of the route to go? Great questions. Okay. And um, so I, I have, I've seen a theoretical paper on that. I haven't seen any um, science proving that, uh, the K with the D, but it makes sense to me because like I mentioned, uh, if you have too much vitamin D, uh, what happens is you can pull a lot of calcium, you'll, have, you'll absorb a lot of calcium, and you'll have those cal that calcium will be in your bloodstream and it can cause a calcification of your arteries. And vitamin K, uh, vitamin K1 can get converted into vitamin K2, and this is an important cofactor for proteins that um, prevent calcification of the arteries. So I think taking the vitamin K with the vitamin Ds makes sense because, you know, if, if you know, you want to prevent yourself from having calcification of your arteries, you know, you want vitamin K. Um, I haven't seen any direct research showing that there's a specific mechanism that vitamin D alone depletes your vitamin K. I, or, I haven't seen that, um, but it makes sense. Uh, and in terms of the cod liver oil, is that what it was? You I think it was fermented cod liver oil. Oh, fermented. See, I'm just not familiar. You know, to me, you know, it's... I, I, what I worry about is too much vitamin A also. I mean, you know, 97 to 1 ratio, I think, in cod liver oil. I don't know about the fermented. Um, but I don't recommend against taking it. Um, I just, I'm not, I haven't familiar, I'm not an expert in that field yet. So I don't want to give an answer. But, yeah, interesting. One last question. Okay. Uh, no, knowing now that hyperthermic conditioning can help with atrophy, would that be a good thing to do for people that are bedridden or... Um, you know, post-surgery recovery or something like that, or if you're in a cast, you know, should you do some kind of heat therapy to help prevent muscle loss? Yeah, that's, these are uh, great questions. Um, I'll start with my anecdotal story, and that is um, I was injured. So I did some experimentation with the sauna a few years ago when I was in graduate school, and I was going probably about four times a week, and I was doing about a 40-minute session a day. Um, and I was injured, so I was out for like a month. Um, and I, it did prevent me from losing muscle mass, but I wasn't severely injured. It was just one of those like arthritic-like things where if you, you just, you're in pain if you lift weights or even when you're running. So I was, I was injured in that sense. But if you're like critically injured, you have a cast, um, I think because heat, hyperthermic uh, conditioning can... Uh, change the plasma volume and the red blood cell count, some of the coagulation factors. Um, when you're when you're in critically injured like that, I would probably, like I said, the stress on top of stress, I would avoid. Um, but that said, for people that are older, don't exercise, um, you know, that are like you said, you know, ridden, I think that the sauna could be a really good way to help maintain muscle mass um, as long as you're not like critically injured. I just want to derive that point home. The stress plus stress is, you know death. <laughs> the cell will die. <laughs> it's too much stress. It can't handle it. It's not the hormetic response that you want, where it's just a little bit of stress that induces the stress response. That's good. So, Paleo community, a big welcome to Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Thank you.